Yeah, thanks. Enter the Sandman. Uh, I wish I had that. I should have queued it up. My bad, John. Uh, we are going to uh, we're going to talk about options, and uh, everybody you know who, who's familiar with me knows that I was an options trader. That's really um, what I'd like to talk about. Let's go over uh, the basics, the stuff we got to get out of the way before we get to the good stuff. Um, in fact, a lot of the options things that we're going to talk about today uh, would fit nicely uh, with a lot of the strategies, John's strategies, which you know roll to a little bit longer time frame. Uh, rolling options in uh, when you've seen those those breakout moves and when his um, when the indicators uh, come up and the scans go go positive for him, options just a great way to do it. So we're going to talk about the Black Shoals options model and option Greeks. I know everybody uh, they hear about the Greeks and they get really um, there are lots of people who like to talk and, and teach options who try to make them very mysterious and appear to be very daunting. Uh, I'm not telling you they're easy, but I am telling you we can talk about them uh, and we can learn, you know, at a high level, what, you know, what are you looking at when you're looking at your options group? As always, the CTU risk disclaimer, there is a high degree of risk involved in trading. Past results are not indicative of future returns, Cyber Trading University and all the affiliates. Uh, we assume no responsibility for trading uh, and investment results. Take a second to read through the rest of that. Uh, I'm going to take a, a breath and we will get going in one minute. About Cyber Trading University, CTU has been an educational trading institution since 1995. CTU established itself as a leader by first working directly with the SOS trading firms to teach them day trading. Uh, back in the day, we used to call them the SOS bandits, and those SOS bandits are the uh, the pioneers who have uh, blazed the trail that allow us to tra to trade from wherever we are in the world, whether it be equities, options, futures, forex. CTU was one of the first to establish itself as a quality stock market trading school. Each of our instructors, including myself, has had a minimum of six years actual trading experience before we begin to work with students. Over the past 14 years, we've taught thousands of students to be successful and profitable traders. Our CTU headquarters are located in the heart of the trading world in New York. Anybody who's ever been on a, uh, a webinar with me, uh, knows the standard bad joke here. My mother's the only one who likes this slide. <laughs> um, got my master's degree from applied uh, applied finance from Macquarie University uh, in Sydney, Australia, back in '89. Uh, bachelor's of, of financial management from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, '87. Traded crude oil options at the New York Mercantile Exchange. Was the head uh, options market maker for JAS Securities, a privately held trading firm at the Philex. Uh, I manage the firm's portfolio risk for the team of 10 options for traders, including myself. While I was managing everyone else's risk, I was also a market maker in Dell Computer. Uh, I did direct our all-floor trading unit uh, for JAS for a while, and while doing that, was qualified to trade on the ISE, the International Securities Exchange, as a DTR. Um, yes, John, I do know him. And... Um, we are going to, uh, hey Grant, how are you this morning, or this afternoon? So we are gonna get going, we're gonna talk a little options. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanna let make sure everybody knows that uh, we will be dialing up the options education here at Cyber Trading University. The first of those is going to be our silver options package, end of the month, the 25th and the 26th, 5.30 and 7.30. Um, I'm gonna be leading the, the class. Uh, if you join today, following the link below, and we will fire that up in the uh, in the window for you. It's the promo price of ninety seven dollars. Uh, you also get with that the cyber uh, group access for a month, which I mean, not that my trade my education's not worth it, but just access to the cyber group for a month's worth. Um, it, you know, it, it runs what did it say seven hundred ninety seven dollars. So you get a month's access, uh, in, as well as four hours of trading. And we're going to start. Kind of at the beginning, we're going to talk about options. We're going to talk about what they are, how you can use them. We're going to talk about some trading strategies. We're going to end with one of my favorite ways to um, – my favorite trading strategies, which is gamma trading. Um, I really like gamma trading. There's a, a, a As a floor trader, it was a great way to generate profits while trading on the floor, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, we'll – Dial back to this at the end of uh, our presentation today. 
But this is going to be for those of you who have always wanted to learn about options. Maybe you never had the time. Maybe you were a little bit intimidated. Um, maybe you just, you know, never thought that you could uh, master this. Well, take it from me. We can make sure that you understand options. After these four days, you'd be able to go out, put on trades, understand the risk, understand the rewards. And maybe you're somebody who was always told, well, options are dangerous. You bought into the misleading quote by um, a man much, much smarter than me, uh, the leader of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, I, I just, I don't believe that derivatives are the, um, uh, the weapons of financial mass destruction that, that, that they've been made out to be. So we're going to talk about end of the month. It's going to be great. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. So going to give you a taste of what you can expect and more uh, when you join us back at the end of the month. So we're going to go options as derivative instruments. And what do we want to talk about here is what is an option at its base? Um, yeah, Mr. Buffett does not like um, does not claim to like it, but you're right, John, he does sell uh, puts. Um, what is a derivative instrument? Um, a derivative instrument is a financial instrument whose value is derived, hence the name, from the value of an underlying instrument. So when you talk about an option, the value of the option, whether it be an option on equities, on currencies, on futures, anything, the, the value of that option is put in place by, the, by something else, the value of the underlying uh, asset. You can talk about um, forwards and futures, and those values are derived from the underlying value, I mean, pardon me, of, like forwards are derived from the future value of um, an underlying in and of themselves, not a, uh, you can talk about when we went back to the, the crash back in 2008 um, and the financial crisis, a lot of the reasons why, if you're interested in this, Phenomenal book by Michael Lewis, uh, The Big Short, uh, really delves into what happened with the financial instruments, these derivative products, um, collateralized debt obligations, and how those built. All of those things are derivatives in a broad sense. We're going to talk specifically about options, and in particular, equity options in this case. These derivatives convey no direct ownership of the underlying. So an option on equities is not like owning stock from the traditional, I get to vote and I get to, you know, go to the Disney, um, I buy Disney stocks so I can go to the Disney shareholders meeting and hang out with um, Disney executives. That's not, you don't own the stock. You own the right to own some stock or you own the right to sell some stock, depending on what kind of a, a derivative you own. Um, and what you need to understand is that when you take options in particular, the movement of an option is much more of a three-dimensional um, movement than the linear movement you are used to with equities. Uh, John touched on it earlier, uh, you know, the idea of up and down. And, and one of the things that you find in the equity market in particular, um, there's, a, there's a belief that uh, up is good, down is bad. And if you turn on CNBC, you know, everyone smiles when there's green numbers at the bottom and the market is up and everyone looks glum when the market is down because in general, the general public believes that um, up is good, down is bad. And as we know, if you look at any of those charts John just had up there, you know, on the way to up, there can be some down and there are opportunities. And what we're going to talk about is Options allow you to profit in up and down movement, depending on your strategies, and they can also eliminate some of the, um, the biases and, the, and, and remove some of the limitations that are out there for short selling in an equity market. Um, the purchase of a put by itself gives you a similar position. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm just taking a basic, but a similar position to a short stock position without a lot of the risk, depending on how you do it, and margin requirements. But on top of that, stocks, as we said, move in a linear fashion. But options can move. Um, I like to think of them as a three-dimensional movement because just because you are long a call doesn't necessarily mean that when the underlying stock goes up, you can um, you will see the value of your option 
move or the anticipated amount. And let me give you a perfect example of that. When I was a market maker in Dell Computer, um, at the point at which we had become the largest equity option trading in the United States, we probably had 100 people standing in our crowd. And as we would approach expiration, pardon me, uh, earnings, we would have retail investors and the public and uh, professional investors coming in. Um, back then, Dell was, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it was Google or Apple, but it was a big, big stock. And there was a lot of interest around their earnings. And for example, and I'm going to just make up the numbers, the story is the same. If, if Dell was trading at, say, $27, and on the day of expiration, people would be coming in and trying to buy calls, anticipating good news, anticipating a move to the upside. So you would have people coming in, buying, let's say, um, the 27 and a half calls with the stock trading, um, or let's say the 30 calls with the stock trading at 28, and they're anticipating a move to the upside. So we would be selling calls, but what would happen is the volatility would be increasing. We might start selling those calls at a dollar. We could be selling them at a dollar and a half. We could be selling them at two dollars, depending on the interest and the trading that was going on. Well, with the underlying at 28, someone buys their calls at um, at two dollars. Their break-even point is 32 is 32 dollars. Well, the news comes out, and everything is great. And what's the first thing that happens the next day after expiration? The market immediately eliminates and crushes what we would call crushes volatility. Volatility in those options may have gotten up to, again, I'm just picking numbers, may have gotten up to 25, 30, 35, 40 vol. Well, first thing that happens is the next morning, vol comes in. Why is that? Well, there's no more real um, uncertainty in the market. So if let's say the stock opens up at 32, now the person who's anticipating their the $2 calls that they bought on the 30 line to be worth four more four dollars or five dollars or six dollars is sad to find out that those are probably they're two dollars in the money and they could be two and a half dollar bid and they're thinking well wait a second stock just went up four dollars i owned calls that i paid two dollars for and they're only up 50 cents how's that possible well it's that three-dimensional piece of volatility we removed volatility from the market um, therefore the vol the price of the um uh, underlying the price of the options did not move as much because it pulled one of the levers in the option pricing model. Uh, what probably happened in that trade is um, the, uh, the we sold those calls and probably bought stock against them, um, and most of the market makers then would have made money with a short volatility. So don't get confused by the fact that just because uh, options are different that they're going to be hard to understand. But you do have to remember there are a lot more uh, components to how an option is priced than just the price of the underlying. Let's talk about terminology with options. There are two con two ways that you can, um, at the end of an, of an when an option expires, um, you have exercise or assignment. What does it mean? If you wish to use your option, you submit an exercise instruction to your broker, um, long position, someone who owns will exercise. If you are forced to buy or sell a stock, you've been assigned, short positions get assigned. So again, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but there's a difference between an exercise and an assignment. It has to do with ownership. We also have two different kinds of options. It's going to come up in a minute when we talk about the Black Scholes model, but um, American options allow you to exercise at any point uh, while you own that option up to and including at expiration. European style options, owners can only exercise at expiration, which means you can get out of an option by selling it, but if you own the option, you must, in European exercise, you can't exercise it until expiration occurs. What's the significance? Well, in particular with equity options, one of the big factors can be the value of dividends for stock ownership. We talked earlier about the difference between owning an option and owning stock. If you own a thousand shares of stock and it pays a 50 cent dividend, your stock is worth more than 10 calls that give you the right to buy 
a thousand shares of stock because the right to buy does not give you the dividend and the dividend is what you would want you own a thousand shares of stock um, and you, you get a 50 cent dividend there's five hundred dollars in value in that so when pricing them the american style uh, options have a different pricing model that was developed after the original black shoals which we'll talk about in a little bit so the difference is at expiration and in fact some of the uh for example the fill x's foreign currency options are european exercise there is no early exercise available again countries don't pay dividends so you can eliminate one of the big reasons why and what happens in re in real life uh used to happen a lot happens a little bit less now but there used to be a thing we would do called dividend spreads and what you would do is you would buy and sell options um deep 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 in the money and you would exercise and then be assigned on those a little bit of a complicated trade long story short what you were trying to do is you were trying to find someone who owned a very deep in the money call who did not exercise it and you were able to kind of jump their um jump their dividends uh, payable. So it's, it used to be, Philex was famous for doing dividend spreads. Uh, they used to do them by the boatload, uh, particularly with high dollar dividends. It was a, a real profitable uh, trade when you could catch somebody who was napping and not watching the position. Um, the expiration date, we're talking about options, we're gonna show you in a little bit, they do expire. Um, it's the date at which the options expire. You cannot buy or sell an option on or after the expiration date. Let's be clear, the expiration date is the Saturday following the third Friday of the month. Most people believe that it, expiration is Friday. Well, that's the last day of trading. Technically, the options expire Saturday. And the only reason I'm very particular about this and why I know it so well is um, early in my career when I was a, a clerk at the American Stock Exchange and then over at the New York Mercantile Exchange, I spent many a Saturday uh, once a month at the exchange making sure that our um, positions settled properly. Uh, it was much more critical at the New York Mercantile Exchange, the joke always being because it's physical delivery in crude oil, that if you as a clerk screwed up, you would um, have uh, a tanker of oil being delivered to your boss's house. Uh, a scary thought, and nobody, uh, nobody really wanted to ever worry about uh, that happening. So it's the Saturday following the third Friday of the month. The last day you can trade is that Friday. Let's talk about terminology that you're gonna hear me use over and over again. I've already touched on it slightly. How can I be long and be short at the same time? Well, those two words can mean two different things. So you have to make sure you understand them in context. You can have long and short in reference to ownership. So in that case, long means you bought or you're the owner of, in our example, options. If you are short, you have sold, again, in our example, options. This has nothing to do with direction. It's purely about ownership. If I bought 10 Dell calls, I, you would hear a trader say, I'm long 10 Dell calls. Um, if you were short 10 Dell calls, you would sold them. You'd, be, you'd tell people, I'm short 10. Um, so long and short can refer to ownership of underlying. Now, again, the same thing for, um, uh, for equities. You can say I'm long the stock and I'm short the stock, but in equities, those two direction and ownership are the same. If you're long stock, you profit to the upside. If you're short stock, you profit to the downside. Well, with options, long and short refer to ownership, and they can also refer separately to direction. So long means I will profit or should profit, anticipate profiting in an upside move, Short means directionally, I would profit on a downside move. So how can you be long and be short? Well, if you are long a put, you would own a put, but your profit would be maximized on a downside move. So keep these terms clear. Um, it can be confusing. I understand that. But you're going to hear me use it over and over and over again. And all traders that you'll find will talk this way. And sometimes it's confusing wait a second, Greg said he was long, but he's short. What does he mean? Because we come from, or most of the people on the, on the uh, call today come from a world where long is ownership and direction, short is ownership and direction. With options, it can be 
Um, you can be short and be long. How would you be short and be long? You could be short a put, and theoretically then you have a position that will profit um, on an upside move. So that terminology is key. As you begin to build your, com your comfort and your uh, confidence using options, using the right terms is very, very, um, is very, very key. Um, you, 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 don't ha you have me hopefully politely reminding you that you need to learn this. Um, I learned it a completely different way. Um, I learned about bid and ask um, and making sure that hand signals are correct. And long and short, buy and sell when you're in a futures trading pit is critical because when I learned it, it was hand signals. There was no computers. We weren't sending orders via computer where you could look at a screen. It was my boss standing in the options pit, me standing with my back, physically standing with my back to our, our broker in the pit, standing at the edge of the New York Mercantile Exchange crude oil ring. And there's no better way to learn, although more, no more embarrassing way to learn, uh, than when you make a mistake, when you give a bad hand signal. And once I made the mistake of buy and sell, I mistakenly took an order because I wasn't paying attention. I mistakenly took a buy as a sell. Um, luckily for me, it was relatively quiet in the pit. And that gave my boss the opportunity to come screaming. And I don't mean figuratively screaming. I mean literally screaming out of the pit, screaming at me in front of the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange, uh, saying, you know, I said buy, not sell. That was a buy, just berating me. Thankfully, it was quiet there until he started screaming. Then he was the only voice you could hear. That's a great way to learn a lesson. I don't necessarily recommend it, and you won't hear me yell at you like that. Uh, but that's what we're going to talk about. And the more you become comfortable with how to talk like a trader, how to think like a trader, how to execute trades like a trader, the better you'll become um, as you, you know, move down the line and becoming an expert trader. Let's talk about calls and puts, the building block of all options. Calls, what are they? The owner, who is long, of a call option has, and I put it in red because it's really important. Plus, I like the, the, bold, the, uh, the bold and the red. Um, has the right but not the obligation to purchase the underlying security at a specific price, which is our strike price, until expiration. The key here is the right. Once you buy the option, you have the rights. You have the choice. The ball's in your court. If you're playing poker, you know, it's on you. You get to decide what the next move is. Um, you can think of yourself as being on the button. You get to be the person who's making the decisions. If you're the seller of a call option, you're short a call option, you have an obligation. You've traded your rights for a fee. We call that a premium. The option's premium. What did you pay? What did the call owner pay to the seller to give up those rights? You're obligated to sell the underlying security at a specific price until expiration. Again, these examples are built around the idea that there is one transaction in your portfolio. There are ways to offset these obligations um, and these, uh, these positions, but at its base, the owner of a call option has the right but not the obligation to purchase. So the owner of a call option, all other things equal, is going to be someone who is looking for the underlying security to increase in value so that the value of their call also increases. Um, I know that um, two back, I think it was John, when he was talking about his Apple trades and he said he had Apple calls out um, laddered up, it sounded like, um, again, we, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago in our cyber group and just, I happened to pick Apple and looked at it. Um, the purchase of calls, the purchase of puts can be, particularly for somebody who is a longer term swing trade and beyond investor, um, a, a safer, more economical way to execute those strategies. So again, calls, you have the right but not the obligation to, to uh, buy. If you sell them, you have the obligation to sell. Now we go to the other side. Um, when you think about calls, I try to keep this real simple. Calls at its base, and I realize this is very, very simple, but think of it as a coupon. If you've got pizzas that are selling for $15, is there any immediate benefit to owning a coupon where I can go buy a Papa John's large one uh, three-topping pizza for 10 bucks? Yeah, 
there would be value there. If I can buy it for $10 and they're selling for $15, there's, that coupon has some value. We would call it intrinsic value. Um, the uh, options, you know, so thinking about a call option, it's giving you ripe monopoly obligation. You don't have to go buy a pizza at Papa John's, but if you did and you had a $10 coupon, you would be able to buy below the market. You'd buy and have some value. So one of the simple connect the dots in your in your brain things to do is think about calls, at, you know, at that coupon idea uh, until you grasp thoroughly what you're looking at. It's one of the ways to think about it. And here's what the P&L looks like for a um, – let me change my – go to red. Here's what the P&L looks like for a long call position. What can you tell by this? Well, because of the distance from here to here, let me, let me use the fatter one, it's a little easier to see. The distance from here to here, we know that we paid $4 for the call for this stock because um, the max loss is $4 all the way out through here. So this line extends all the way back. So we know that all we can lose when buying this call is $4. And the underlying price the strike has got to be 50 because that's where our break is, and we know that that price there is 50, um, 54 because that's the point at which our break even occurs when we get back our four dollars and we're above our 50 strike. So um, we've got the limited. Let me clear this so you can see it again. We've got the limited loss. All we can lose is four dollars. We don't see this going up, but theoretically our profit could go to infinity. It's the basics of a call. You know what you can lose when you get involved in the trade. Buying a call, all you can ever lose is what you put into the trade, uh, and you can participate on an upside move. A um, couple of questions here have come up. Uh, someone's asking me, is it better to own um, stocks, pardon me, options rather than stocks if you're holding uh, trades for a few weeks to a few months. Well, that's sort of a blanket statement. It would be hard to be just to be able to say yes without quantifying it. Depending on what your objectives are and the cost involved, it can be a more cost-effective way to take those positions. Cost less to own the options, John's example earlier. Cost less to own the options in Apple than it does to be able to, to buy a, what now, $600-plus stock. Um, I don't know what your account looks like, but for me, that'd be a little on the pricey side. But the options are uh, available at strikes that allow you to participate. And you don't, you should never just trade the options because the, the stock's too expensive. You want to try to trade it because you found value in the trading and the options allow you to take care of it. So that can, um, that can, um, that, that can be a good way to, to go about it. I will try to answer questions at the end. Um, when we get through this presentation, if you've got any, I can hang around and answer some questions for everybody semi-offline. But we'll keep the presentation moving. If I'm the person who sold that call to the previous gentleman, if you look, they sort of – they look similar. But what happens is if you're the seller of the call, your max profit is the distance between zero and your premium, which is $4. If you get to 50, anything above 50, because the other person's going to start making, you're going to directionally be losing. Above $54, you start losing dollar for dollar um, and can theoretically go, stock could go to infinity. Your P&L gets destroyed. You're then short one for one. Again, if you haven't hedged the trade, if you haven't done anything else. So a simple look at what does the P&L graph look at, it's exactly the opposite of the owner of the call. This person, their max profit is $4 and in this example, um, and over $54, they start losing. They're, they're making no money at all, and they start losing dollar for dollar, um, can lose, start losing up to a dollar for dollar for the stock. So uh, being na na this would be called being naked short calls. Um, I'm going to be clear. I don't think anybody in this call um, should ever, 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 ever just be naked short calls or puts. What's naked short means? You have no hedge in place. You should not just go sell puts or sell calls 
without a hedge strategy on it. They can lead to um, uh, financial mass destruction, as, uh, as Mr. Buffett said. Uh, so that's a bad thing to do, and that's not what we're going to talk about here. The idea that we're going to talk about is owning options, doing option spreads, making sure that you, on balance, are net long options and not putting yourself in a position where your P&L can look like this. We're not going to talk about that type of trading. Um, that moves more towards you know, the extreme expert professional. Trust me, I've had those positions on. Most of the gray hair that I have, uh, besides for my kids, has come from being you know, short, na naked short options or, God forbid, you know, short in stream, uh, short straddles and volatility. Um, they will make you old. Uh, they will keep you up at night, and we're not going to put you guys in that kind of uh, trading strategies. Um, what are puts? Puts. The owner of a put who is long has the right but not the obligation to sell the underlying security at a specific price until expiration. The seller of a put has the obligation, same idea, to buy the underlying security regardless of where it goes. So you'll often hear people say, you know what, I sell puts because um, if XYZ stock, let's just, I'll take Apple as an example. There might be people out there saying, um, well, yeah, I mean, I'll sell the, the Apple 580 puts because if it gets back down to 580, I want to buy it there anyway. I can tell you from experience, um, when a stock goes charging down towards your short put, the last thing on your mind is, well, I wanted to own it here anyway, because then you feel like you're playing the you know, catch a falling knife game, which is not a lot of fun to play. And I don't recommend it um, for anybody. So um, be careful. You'll hear people tell you that, you know, well, if you, if you sell these puts, um, you then get long at that level, and it's a great way to enter a trade. Uh, I would beg to differ. Um, and I don't want anybody on this call out there naked selling of puts. Um, ownership of puts is fine, and I, and I think a great possibility. I spent some time with one of our um, one of the group uh, at uh, the cyber group, might be the platinum group at CTU, and we were talking about his portfolio, and uh, he's got a retirement portfolio and he's looking to insure. And we were talking about, hey, could you use puts? And we were discussing, geez, could you could I take some S and P puts, maybe ladder them out, and put some protection in my in my um, in my portfolio, and yes, we, we, we talked and thought that might be a pretty good idea for them. People always have trouble thinking about puts because of the downside component. One of the best ways to do it is think about puts like insurance, particularly car insurance. Let's say you buy a brand new car for $20,000. When you insure that car with replacement value, that if the car gets totaled, and everyone's safe in my example, no one was hurt, just the car. Um, you know, no, no people were hurt in the uh, making of my example. Uh, you, you can go back to the insurance company and put back to them your old car and say, hey, I want, I want a brand new car again because I've paid for this insurance. So it gives you the right but not the obligation to sell. In our example of the car, you get to put the car back to the, to the insurance company and get a new car. In the idea of equity options, you get to sell the stock at a price regardless of where the current price is. And that can be a good thing in a, in a crashing down market. Here's what a put uh, P&L looks like. Uh, it's very similar. Uh, uh, if you think about it logically, since we want a downside move, in this case, again, it's a $4 option. There's that $4. So we know it's a $4 option. When this $50 stock gets below $46, we start profiting on the downside move. As it goes lower, now in theory, all you can make you're capped at zero. Um, they always talk that stocks can go to infinity, but um, they can only go to zero. Um, the bad news is sometimes they do, and don't forget that. Uh, ask the people, poor people of Enron or uh, Lehman Brothers. So that's what the put P&L looks like. And here's what a short put looks like, putting you at risk to lose up to $50 if you, well, technically 46, if you short this put, because it's a $50 put, You've got $4 in premium. There's your profit on the graph right there. And then once we pass $46, it's um, you're losing and the owner is winning. So that's a quick graph as to what they would look like, um, the P&L the graph for a call and a put. Real quick, what's the Option Clearing Corporation? 
it's a guarantee of performance of all contracts. Um, what does an option, the OCC do? They stand between myself and the counterparty to our trade. So that if you would default, the OCC or their clear or the, the, the clearing firm for your trading partner or the OCC guarantees that I can execute my trade um, and fulfill my obligations without worry about my counterparty. Why is this important? In fact, it goes back to the too big to fail in 2008. The biggest concern, I believe, was yes, the, the financial instability, but if they had allowed some of those banks to fail, they all were so intertwined with obligations between CDOs and all kinds of trades that were intertwined. When I lose half of my hedge, I'm now exposed, need to go to the market. And here's a perfect example. I used to trade at the New York Mercantile Exchange, and every year they would have an NCAA tournament futures pool. And back then, 64 teams, the winning team, if you owned one futures contract, you got $64. So there would be active trading in every possible team you can imagine. So let's just say, I don't know, let's say, for example, St. Joseph's University, where I went, um, was a big favorite. That would be great probably not going to happen, but let's just use them because I like doing this my example. Um, if I bought a St. Joe's future for, say, $2, and then I sold it to somebody else, they win the first two rounds, and now it's trading at $8. Well, I sell somebody my one future at $8. Well, what have I done? Theoretically, I've just made $6. I bought it at $2. I sold it at $6. And then God shines down on St. Joe's University. St. Joe's wins the national championship. Well, I'm really happy because um, the guy who I sold it, to, who I bought it from for $2 has to give me $64, $62. Well, he pays me 64 here, he got my two. And then I have to turn around and give $64, um, net the eight, to the guy who um, I sold it to. But let's say the guy that I bought it from says, Greg, I don't have the money, you're out of luck. Well, that's called counterparty risk. And part of the reason why I never participated in this is because I was always concerned about counterparty risk. Well, the OCC makes sure that if I buy my $2 St. Joe's, I know that I can get paid on the other side, therefore allowing me to sell St. Joe's at $8, take my $6 profit, and move on. So the OCC plays a critical role in ensuring the safety and security of all options trades. That's where they stand in the market. Let's talk about the Black-Scholes model. It's the model that brought us um, the modern option pricing that we know. Just the history lesson on it, developed by Fisher Black and Myron Scholes, in their and it, it was introduced in their 1973 paper, The Pricing of Options and Corporate Liabilities. Um, the key to the option pricing model, it was used to determine the way to hedge the option using a ratio of the underlying security. It took the value and gave you a number that allowed you to determine how could you hedge your position to a thing we called it delta neutral. But that was the, the simple basic reason why the Black-Scholes model was brought into play, you know, 40 years ago. There are some basic assumptions which in today's market may or may not, again, this was the original model. Um, there were European exercise only. They've modified that. The risk-free rate and volatility remain constant. Rather an aggressive assumption, but it got us to where we are today. Stocks pay no dividends. Clearly a hurdle that we have been able to overcome in newer models. Markets are efficient. I, okay, everyone can snicker to themselves about markets being efficient, uh, and we'll move on. So today, with the horsepower, computing power that we have, there's probably, you know, hundreds of different options pricing models. Black Shoals is the one that sort of got it started. Some of its faults, some of its assumptions that may or may not work in the real world led to better models. You'll hear about the binary model, the Bjorgen Stenslin model. There's lots of models out there. Every good trading desk out there probably has their own option pricing model with the ability to do things like skew options volatility and options smiles, and we'll talk about that down the road. But this basic model got us to where we are today, and it's really the way, once you understand what are the components, it allows you to then understand how can 
um, I use these components in this three-dimensional world of options that we're talking about to go beyond the linear trading of equities. Now, everybody take a breath. There will be no test on this at the end. I will not ask anyone, I will not call anyone out um, and ask them to replay the fact that C uh, S T equals N um, one sub D uh, times S minus, that's the model. What I wanna talk about are the inputs. The N is the cumulative distribution function or the standard normal distribution. T is obviously time. S is the spot price. K is the strike price. R is the risk-free rate. Um, we have volat Vega is the volatility at the bottom. So what do I want you to take from this jumble of, um, I'm sure some of you are, are cringing and won't look at your screen right now. Trust me, it won't hurt you. Um, I, but what I want you to understand is to determine in general the price of an option, these factors go into it. Um, how much time do we have until expiration? A number relatively easy to determine. What's the underlying or spot price of our asset? Again, relatively easy to determine. What's the strike that we're talking about? Relatively easy to determine. And what's our current risk-free rate? What's the interest rate input that we have? relatively easy to determine. Um, we also have the, um, the cumulative distribution function is where it gets a little dicey. And the one for me that really makes this model go is the volatility. Now, some of you have heard there's an index out there that I like to keep an eye on, the VIX, the volatility index. It's kind of the fear factor, the panic factor in the market. But the volatility piece is where options can go from science to art, the ability to understand volatility. That's the factor that will move the underlying more than anything else because we know how many days there are at expiration. We know what the underlying price is right now. We know what the strike price is. We've assigned a risk-free rate. If there are dividends in a model where it matters, we know when they're paid. All those factors are relatively static the volatility piece is the one that will really drive the value, and it's the hardest, obviously, to determine. So when we talk about volatility, it's the one that really keeps this thing moving. Um, because we have this model, there's a thing called um, the ability synthetics. And what does that mean? There's a here's a a three-sided position that has no risk based on the options volatility. Now, there's a slight, there's a, if you if you wanted to do the heavy math, this is a simplified version of the heavy math. Um, for any of you quants out there, I recognize the implication of time and I understand um, factoring that in and the, um, there is a little bit more if you wanted to get into the nuts and bolts than this simple equation. But in general, for the retail investor, knowing these relationships can allow you to maneuver this three-dimensional world relatively easily. What's it mean? The value of the stock plus the value of the put minus the value of the call is going to equal zero. Do that again. Stock plus put minus call zero. So, we have, pardon me, is going to equal there's no risk in the trade. And why is that? Well, we can make for any of you who passed, you know, freshman algebra, we can make a synthetic call out of this relationship. How would we do that? Well, first, we need to move the call since it's equal to zero. We move the call over to this side. That's now a positive C, which is right here. What does that equal? Well, we got rid of this because we moved it. So the stock plus the put equals the call. Stock plus the put equals the call. So you should be able to determine the value of the call and the position, the synthetic position of that you have based on this simple annotation of stock plus put equals call. And let's think about it. We're going to show you in a second. 
that owning a stock, let me see, is it the next slide? Yeah, it's coming up. I'll show it to you here in a second. So another view of creating this, any one of the three pieces can cre be created synthetically by the other two. Long put, we already said it, long put, long stock equals a long call. To get the opposite of that trade, you'd have the short call. So you can make any of these by moving around this simple equation. I'll show it to you again. Knowing that allows you, in fact, I like to remember this one and I just move, I take the zero out, stock plus the put, long put, long stock, long put equals long call. And here it is. If you look at the P&L for stock, pardon me, the P&L for a call, I apologize, this is a call, and this is long stock and long put, exactly the same thing. Why is that? Because here's the P&L for the stock, but we know that the put gives you insurance below this level, therefore creating the same thing. Why is this useful to you? Well, let's say you have a stock position and you want to try to insure it. Um, if you already own the stock, it wouldn't make sense necessarily to liquidate the position and go out and buy calls. Maybe it does, but in general, you could simply enter a put into your position uh, in, the, in the correct ratio, and you would have created a P&L that would allow you to simulate a call without necessarily having a call. How would we be sure to put? Using the same thing again, we have, now again, we're moving this out of here. So now it's stock, long stock, short call is being sure to put. Again, we're just rolling around using the black shoulder model's basic ideas to be able to maneuver around this three-dimensional world. There it is again, and there's our P&L, same thing. This is, um, if we look up here, this is long stock, because there's the stock piece. And then short a call, that's our cap, and that's exactly the same as being naked short a put. So the P&Ls match exactly. Again, done in the proper ratio. And then to create synthetic stock, um, there's lots of reasons why you might want to do that. You move up everything to the other side. If you are long the stock, pardon me, long the call, short the put, it's the same as being long the stock, because this gets wiped out and that gets wiped out as we do on that. So long stock is equal to long call, short put. And here's what that P&L looks like. I'm sure you can all guess what it looks like, but that's what it looks like. This is long stock. And again, done at the right strike prices and all those kind of things, you can create a long call, short put, that will, your P&L will act exactly the same as a long um, as long stock. Now, you can do the exact opposite. Let's say you've got a hard to borrow stock, and lots of times this happens as part of things like people doing boxes, and we won't get into all that, but right now. But you could create, if you wanted to create short stock, what would you do? You'd short the call, long the put, and you'd have exactly the opposite P&L. You'd have that one coming down. I'm sorry. Yeah, you short stock going down, you, it would go up. Yeah, that's exactly what it would look like. So you've got this ability to maneuver around the three-dimensional world using calls, puts, and stock if you choose to. Now let's talk about the Greeks um, as we get towards the end of the presentation here today. Um, there are about, um, we're going to talk about the four, I think it's four we did, four. Um, delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho. No, that's still five, Greg. Learn how to count. Um, and delta, we talked earlier about the hedge ratio, the reason, the, the driving factor behind the Black-Scholes model was how can we hedge these positions? Um, by hedging, what do we mean? R mitigate some of the risk or all of the risk depending on what you're talking about. You'll hear people refer to delta as the rate of change. You'll hear people mention um, delta, delta as the hedge ratio. 
there's also people who like to think about the delta as what's the percentage chance that the option that I own or I'm, I'm long or short will expire or close in the money. Let's take a step back. What are options that are in the money? That is an option that has, um, if it's a call, the underlying price is trading above the strike price for you. So it is above the strike price, you are in the money. If you have a put, it would be the underlying spot price trading below the strike price uh, of your put. So what, it's the, uh, what are the chances that the underlying will trade, uh, will close at this point in time? What are the odds that it's going to finish in the money? It's one of the ways to look at it. It doesn't mean that it's in the money now. It just means that, again, I don't necessarily like to use that. I'm, I'm old school. Some would just say I'm old. Uh, I like to use it. It's, it's the rate of change. It's the hedge ratio. And what do I mean by that? Delta is a number between zero and 100. Derived from the Black-Scholes or whatever options model you have will refer to Black-Scholes. Um, you can find it. I know Don Kaufman from uh, Thinkorswim. Uh, I would recommend going and getting a demo account. Again, I don't work for Thinkorswim. I just love their platform. They're phenomenal. They're great with options traders. Really, really. In fact, uh, I think they're the best. I just, I've known those guys for a very long time. Um, they do a great job, and if you go to their site and you bring up an option series, whether someone mentioned weekly options, whether they mentioned, um, you know, long-term options, you can set up your um, screen view to show you the options Greek. And what's the delta going to tell you? The delta is going to tell you at its base how much should your underlying, pardon me, your option move up or down based on the movement of the underlying. Simple example, your stock is trading at 20 and you have a 50 delta call option. I don't care what the strike is. You have a 50 delta call option. The underlying goes up a dollar. You should then see a 50 cent increase in your option price. Now again, like I said, this is a three-dimensional world. There are more factors than exactly that because we're going to see gamma in a second. As the delta increases, the delta increases. The rate of change increases but the rate of change, and therefore you may not get exactly that. But what it allows you to understand is that, and you'll notice that you can equate price a lot of times to delta. For example, if you are trading those Apple calls, and you trade a strike that is a higher delta, which means it's either close to or at close to or in the money, and therefore with the high delta, let's say it's 75, that every dollar it moves, you should see 75 cent increase in your option. Those are going to be priced higher than, let's say, a 25 delta option. Because if you own a 75 delta option or a 25 delta option, the underlying move of a dollar is the same for everybody. But if you own a 75 delta option, it's going to move, in theory, 75 cents your underlying, uh, pardon me, your option price. Uh, but the 25 delta option is only going to increase by a quarter. And you're more willing, you have to pay a premium to get more delta to participate in the move. So you're always going to find that higher delta options are going to cost you more. And a lot of times when you're making options decisions, um, you have to factor in how much time do I have left, what's the delta, and what is the anticipated move I, I look to get out of this underlying. There are lots of option strategies where people use out-of-the-money calls and puts to try to get moves. Some prefer to trade at the money or in the money options uh, to, to more fully participate as if it were a stock. But this delta gives you the first basic Greek of how should my option price move in relation to the underlong. Now, again, there are lots of other factors, but that's the basic one. Gamma, and I touched on it a second ago, gives us the rate of change. What does that mean? It's the rate of change of the rate of change. It tells us how much is my delta going to accelerate 
it really measures the velocity of that price change. So if you have a high gamma option, and let's give that same example. You had a, you had a 50 delta option, um, and it moves a dollar. Well, it's very possible that the price could go up by 60 cents or 65 cents rather than the anticipated 50. That's sort of the, the override of gamma. It will increase on a positive, and trust me, it'll kill you on the downside. Um, but what it allows you to do is, because of delta and gamma at the hedge ratio, if you are hedging an options position, as the underlying goes up, you're able to sell stock at higher and higher levels. As the options go down, you're buying at lower and lower levels. So you're buying on the downside, normally a good thing. You're selling on the upside, normally a good thing. You're moving with the market when you have what we call positive, uh, positive gamma. Um, delta is neither um, positive nor negative. It is just, it's the number. Gamma can be, um, well, I guess technically you can be short deltas, but you can be negative gamma, which gives you a reverse effect. So as the underlying goes up, you're getting shorter and you're buying the way up. We'll talk about that at the end of the month. Um, it, that will make you crazy and old and make your hair fall out. We don't want you doing that. So gamma gives you a numerical indicator of how much should the delta accelerate on a positive or decelerate on a negative based on movement of the underlying. Vega, volatility. We talked about it earlier. It's the one piece of this that becomes very difficult. It's to measure the effect of change in volatility on the option of a, on the price of an option. Vega or the volatility, you could have two stocks trading at fifty dollars, and you could have two fifty dollar eight fifty dollar calls, and one with the exact same time to expiration, and one could be priced at a dollar, and one could be priced at five dollars. And the biggest reason why is the $5 option has got a volatility um, that is higher, more likely to move. Um, it can be cumulative when you're building volatility to measure the risk of a portfolio or an individual option. But what Vega will do, it will tell you that what should happen to the value of your option based on a movement in the underlying. It all goes back to standard deviation. Let's do